Okay. Um, hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the We Validate Community of Practice webinar series. Today, we are so excited to have uh, Bimbika um, and her team presenting their um, the recent pilot study on women's time news and agency in, Do in Indonesia. Um, um, let me go ahead and introduce our presenters. So we have um, Amy Damon, who's a professor of economics in the Department of Economics at McAllister College, United States. Um, we also have um, Diahadi uh, Setionaluri, sorry if I don't pronounce it correctly, who's a researcher um, at the Institute of Economic and Social Research and the Demographic Institute at the Faculty of Economics Business, University of Indonesia. She's also a gender econ economist at the Australia-Indonesia Partnership for Economic Development, or PROSPERA. Um, and next, we have Usha Adelina Riento, who's an economist for the Gender Disability and Social Inclusion team at Prospera. And last but not least, uh, we have Bimbika C uh, Sijapati Basnet, who heads, the gender, who heads the Gender Disability and Social Inclusion Work Program at Prospera. Um, and after um, the presentations conclude, we will invite our discussant, um, Ruth Maiden Dick, to provide her comments um, on the work that the team will be presenting. Um, and as many of you know, Ruth is a senior research fellow um, in the Natural Resources and Resilience Unit at IFPRI. So during the webinar, um, as usual, please use the chat to ask questions, um, share your comments, and engage with the speakers and other partners, um, um, yes, during and after the presentation. And uh, without further ado, I will now hand it over to Bimbika to introduce the team um, and the work and get us started. Over to you, Bimbika. Thank you so much, Ara, and thank you, everyone, so much for joining this webinar. Um, okay, sorry, I got a notification that I was spotlighted. I thought maybe I was mute. <laughs> so I'm from the Australia-Indonesia Partnership for Economic Development, also known as PROSPERA, and some of you might know me because I was previously at Center for International Forestry Research in Indonesia. So I lead PROSPERA's efforts to support the Indonesian government in promoting women's economic participation. And as you'll hear from my colleague Usha uh, shortly, women's economic participation in Indonesia has stalled and uh, possibly due to entrenched social norms that view domestic and caregiving responsibilities as so solely women's duties and not a shared responsibility. This in turn limits women's time and opportunities for paid work. To investigate this hypothesis and understand women's choices and agency in time use decisions, we worked with tools and guidance from Greg Seymour and colleagues. We also collaborated with the ILO Department of Statistics on global time use data collection efforts and with additional support from UN Women and another DFAT pro uh, funded program called Investing in Women, we expanded our sample size. Uh, today, we're really excited. Um, sorry, kind of a lot. So today, we're really excited to share our, this work. Um, I think there's a problem with the presentation. Usha? Um, so today, we're really excited to share our work and uh, um, and uh, um, and also, you know, while most of our work was primarily focused on addressing the policy question of uh, women's labor force participation and what uh, effective interventions may um, sort of increase uh, participation rates, um, we also collaborated with academic partners and interested in publishing this work in uh, reputable journals. So we really hope this webinar uh, presents an opportunity to share our findings and seek your feedback, both on the analytical as well as the policy side. So now I'll pass um, over the floor to my colleagues who led this work. Um, first with Usha, over to you Usha, thank you. Thank you, Bimbika, um, I'm really sorry. Let me just try a little bit with the screen sharing. Okay. We can see it, um, but it's a trend, uh, presentation mode. Uh, can you see the uh, slides now? Oh, yes. Now it's in full screen. All good? Looks good. Yes. 
Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So continuing from what uh, Bimbika has mentioned before, um, I would like to share that in Indonesia, at least in the five, uh, for the past five years, gender gap in education achievement has narrowed. Uh, completion for primary and secondary school is higher for girls than it is for boys. And enrollment in tertiary education is higher for girls, albeit still being very low. And quality-wise, girls already outperform boys in reading and math uh, in PISA. But as you can see from the leftmost pane, uh, female labor force participation in Indonesia has stalled for the past two decades at roughly 50%. Male labor force participation, on the other hand, uh, is roughly 30 percentage point um, higher than that of female. And compared to peer countries, uh, we are lagging behind uh, Thailand, um, Australia, Singapore, and even further from Vietnam. This, this lag in labor force female labor force participation drags down uh, Indonesia's overall performance in achieving gender equality as suggested by the Global Gender Gap Index uh, in the rightmost pane. And we are performing relatively well in educational attainment uh, and also, also in health and survival, but not so much in economic participation and political empowerment. So understanding and addressing women's economic participation in Indonesia calls for a closer look to Indonesian women's time use and their ability to make choices about it, or maybe put simply their agency over their time use. Um, globally, in, in a lot of studies, uh, we found that women's unpaid care work reduces economic participation. And based on a study from ILO, uh, women perform 3.2 times more unpaid care work than men on average. In Indonesia, uh, during COVID-19, we saw around 90% of women leaving jobs, uh, mainly due to household and care work. And at the same time, social and cultural norms also impact work choices. And recently developed instruments like those uh, by Cineroy helped us to measure time use agency. Um, there has been a lot of, well, a couple of pilot time use surveys uh, in Indonesia, but our study seeks to uh, further elaborate on not just how women spend their time, but also their capacity in choosing how to allocate their time. So with that in mind, our study have several uh, objectives or uh, research questions that we would like to try to address. The first one is that we aim to understand how the hours of paid and unpaid work performed by men and women differ. Additionally, we're exploring uh, the variations based on factors like geography. And then moving on, our second research question focuses on uh, unpaid work and its impact on women's labor force participation. We are we are keen to identify the specific types of unpaid work uh, that act as barriers to women's uh, engagement in the labor force. And our third question addresses women's agency in their time use and its effect on their labor force participation. And finally, uh, we conducted a unique experiment to investigate whether individuals um, alter their, their time use uh, decisions when presented with uh, economic opportunities and in this experiment, we will see how couples interaction may influence time use and agency over paid work. And with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Ibururi to take you through the, the findings that we have. Ibururi, over to you. Um, thank you, Usha. And thank you everyone for the opportunities. So um, to answer those research questions, we have two work packages. So the first work package is that we measure the time use using an instrument developed by the ILO that uh, I think Ruth mentioned that uh, initially. And this has key features of having light time use daily format and it collects simultaneous activities and it has a recovery question section to probe time allocated for supervisory care. The second work package is measuring agency. We use a set of attitudinal questions to measure agency components comprised of self-efficacy, decision-making, critical consciousness and voice. And as Usha mentioned, we also did the lab in the field experiment that used vignette questions to understand the intra-household agency. And Amy will explain this in more detail later in the presentation. Next slide, please. And for data collection in this project comprised of three parts. 
uh, we began by conducting cognitive testing where we use the semi-structured questions to assess the instrument to measure the time use and also agency. And the result from the cognitive testing was later used to refine the instrument where we simplified the language, uh, reordering the questions and also refine the experimental vignettes. And after that, we filled it the pilot survey in two steps. Uh, first, in the urban areas with a sample of uh, five, 452 people or two, 226 male female couples in November 2022. And uh, the second one is the pilot survey in rural areas on uh, February with a sample of uh, 450 people and or around 20, 225 couples. This is taking uh, the research site was in Greater Jakarta and also Greater Surabaya in East Java. Uh, next slide, please. Now I will uh, uh, take you to the uh, the measurement uh, from the time use that we get. Um, so this time use measurement, we use the instrument that was developed by LO, as I mentioned before. And the data collection consists uh, of three modules. The instrument consists of three modules, the label for survey, uh, time use uh, diary, and also the agency questions. And we trial the uh, what's so called hybrid like diary instrument uh, with uh, that has the following features. First is it has the fixed episode consists uh, which has 15 minutes window each. And in each of the windows, we can insert, we can input the pre-coded activities uh, that is based on ICATO's uh, decoding scheme. And we also uh, not just uh, uh, taking into account one activities, but also simultaneous activities, two activities. And uh, we have this contextual clarifiers in the time use uh, instrument, where we ask about where the location of the activities take place, who are they uh, with during the activities and who are the beneficiaries of the activities and whether or not the activities are linked to jobs and income generation. And uh, we have this dedicated recovery questions where the enumerators can go back over time and ask about whether the respondents are were doing supervisory care as a secondary activity. And in this uh, project, we use the definition of supervisory care as the time of a person is available and in close proximity to provide active care for a child or dependent adult should the need arise. Next slide, please. Now, um, this is uh, the result uh, from the time use uh, measurement. So this is the average uh, number of hours allocated for paid and unpaid work. Uh, if unpaid work here consists of unpaid domestic and care work. And some points to highlight is that uh, women work about uh, half as many hours as men in paid work, but women work twice as much in unpaid domestic work, more than twice as much in unpaid care. And this difference is even greater for those uh, for women with young children. And overall, women work 30% more hours than men and 60% more if they have young children. Next slide, please. Now, uh, if we see the distribution of the unpaid work, uh, well, as, as expected, women are doing more of unpaid work overall. Uh, for women, for female, uh, women typically share between one to six hours of unpaid work in a day. And some, you know, considerable share uh, actually get or work, working long hours, more than eight hours a day. Meanwhile, um, men's unpaid work hours uh, concentrated towards zero and around 40% only did less than one hour a day for unpaid work. Next slide. And if we look into the allocation of the three components of unpaid work, domestic uh, work, uh, supervisory care and active care, we see that women spend substantial amount of hours for domestic work compared to doing unpaid care, uh, both active and supervisory care. So we sort of uh, assuming that domestic work would be more sticky or stubborn in determining uh, low female labor force participation compared to care work. Um, but uh, maybe we should bear in mind that the low share of women performing active and supervisory care could be caused by a large proportion of women that have uh, older children in our sample. Uh, 
Next slide. Now, um, to answer what types of unfit work uh, that inhibits women's labor force participation, uh, we did a multivariate analysis that estimate individuals' participation in the labor force and to determine which of the unfit work is actually highly correlated with labor force participation. And here uh, we presented a plot of coefficient where the dot shows the point estimate and the line shows the 95% uh, confidence interval. And uh, uh, I would like to make a note that this result uh, may not show a causality since people who work necessarily have less time for unfit work. But uh, nonetheless, uh, for women, the result shows that for women, uh, all forms of unpaid work are negatively associated with their participation in paid work. With unpaid domestic work has the strongest correlation compared to the active and supervisory care, while for men, uh, unpaid domestic and active care work have negative association with their paid work uh, participation. With unpaid active care has the largest uh, correlation. Next slide. So if uh, we run uh, the estimate, the, we estimate for each urban and rural areas, uh, the negative association between unpaid work and labor force participation is stronger in rural compared to urban areas. Uh, so in urban areas, only unpaid domestic work that has significant association with lower female labor force participation. While in rural areas, all three types of unpaid work have significant association with uh, female force participation. But still, domestic work has the strongest correlation compared to other type of unpaid work. And this strong negative correlation in rural areas is likely driving the negative correlation at the aggregate level, level that you saw in the previous slide. Uh, next slide. So uh, we tried to find uh, some sort of uh, answer why there is a weak correlation of unpaid care work uh, with female labor force participation because it seems counterintuitive, particularly in rural areas. So from our qualitative data collection, we understood that, uh, and you may know this also, that in rural areas, uh, care is shared communally, although it is not necessarily available all the time. So in Indonesia, we have the term gotong royong or collective cooperation or mutual assistance uh, that extend to uh, the caregiving for children, both active and supervisory. However, uh, in, case, in areas where agriculture is still the primary occupation, uh, particularly rice farming, women, uh, specifically older women who usually provide childcare uh, are busy working in the paddy field. So if a woman wants to put their children with these uh, women, children would be brought to the paddy field, which made women perhaps uh, reluctant to ask for help uh, to the neighbors, uh, to these women uh, with child care issues. Next slide. And next is how does each of unpaid work uh, correlated with women and men's paid work participation? So this plot show the predicted probability of men and women engaging in paid work across different levels of unpaid work. So we can see that uh, as unpaid domestic work increases on the X axis, the probability of women engaging in paid work uh, falls faster than men. Uh, although it's not statistically significant, the difference in magnitude between uh, male and female uh, tells us that at the same amount of unpaid domestic work, uh, women's chance to participate in paid work is consistently, seems to be consistently lower than men. In the next slide, uh, we see uh, the uh, predicted probability of labor force participation, uh, considering the supervisory care and also active care. Uh, for unpaid uh, supervisory care, uh, it, it has a strong negative correlation on women's labor force participation than on men's. Uh, so supervisory care seems to drag down women's paid work participation at a faster rate than that of men, although at a smaller magnitude compared to the unpaid domestic work uh, in the previous slide. While for unpaid active care, there is a little difference in the association between active care, hours allocated for active care, 
uh, in reducing women and men's labor force participation. Now I would like to hand it over to Amy. Thanks, Rui. Um, so to give you a little bit of a sense, we're investigating obviously uh, labor force participation. So in addition to the many different forms of unpaid care that Rui just talked about, um, we're also thinking about how agency might affect um, labor force participation. And for those of you that are new to this area, uh, agency is an individual's own ability to define goals and pursue them. And we're thinking about how they might um, apply this to their own time use. And um, we are building on some uh, really important work from Sheila, who's here, and co-authors uh, thinking about using attitudinal questions um, to measure time use agency and unpaid work. And um, while we also categorize them like they do in terms of um, critical consciousness and voice um, and others, we also uh, developed two categories of, uh, to categorize paid agency, agency around paid work and agency around unpaid work. We ran questions related to those through a com principal component analysis and cluster analysis to group people into high, medium, and low paid and unpaid agency. And you see on the right, uh, the result of that grouping where um, women ha report or are more likely to report having high unpaid agency. Um, and that would suggest that women have a lot of agency around how they allocate their time between these unpaid activities. Um, and at the bottom in the yellow, we see that uh, men are more likely to, slightly more likely to report high paid work agency. Uh, next slide, please. So when we operationalize these, um, we see these sort of correlations and, and we're really cognizant that these are not causal. These are, these are exploratory, they're descriptive. Um, so here we wanted to look at, do these types of agency have any bearing on labor force participation? And the headline here is that, um, you know, for men, we see no results. So these types or these categories of agency do not explain any labor force choices uh, for men. We do see that they um, have some correlation with women's choices. In urban areas, it is it seems to be unpaid agency that has a positive impact. So having more control over unpaid work increases their labor force participation. And in rural areas, it seems to be um, paid agency, high paid agency that increases their labor force participation. Uh, next slide, please, Isha. <clears throat> so bearing in mind that we're dealing with a lot of correlation and not a lot of causation, we wanted to um, we were we thought hard about how we might be able to get at um, understanding how negotiation or um, some 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 relation of agency might affect people's choices. And what we decided or came up with was to present people with vignettes or stories and ask them questions about how they might respond to these stories. So the story looks, the, the story that we presented looks like this. So imagine you're offered an opportunity to attend a seminar meeting uh, that could increase your income. And we gave them a uh, an sort of an example that was relevant on a normal weekday. This means doing some of your daily tasks or not doing some of your daily tasks or doing them later. You can't bring your kids, but assume you find a responsible caregiver. Um, the workshop is going to run for eight hours, but you can attend less than that, and it's still going to be useful. Um, and then we ask them a number of scenarios. So we say, how many hours would you go if your spouse is gone? Um, how many would you go because you're if your spouse is around? How many would you think it's appropriate for a neighbor of your same gender to attend? And how many do you think it's appropriate for your spouse to attend? So I just want to note here that we ask in V1A, right, um, how many would you go? And then we ask the spouse how many they think the spouse should go. That's going to become important in a couple of slides. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's our um, simple experimental approach. 
So first, we we basically randomly assign people or assign couples into these three different groups. The first is red, which we call public. If you're assigned or if you pull a red ball, um, that means that we are going to ask you to your the husband and wife to be in different rooms. We're going to ask you to respond to the vignettes and. Uh, we're gonna and we're gonna say that these answers will be revealed to the husband between the spouses at the end. Um, in the private, again, people will be taken to different rooms, um, you know, husbands and wives. But then we're gonna say the the answers will not be revealed to the spouses at the end. So they'll just continue with the survey, so they're assured that their uh, answers are private. In the green group, in the negotiation group, the husband and wife sit in the same room and discuss the answers um, with each other uh, at the end of, er, er, you know, uh, for each of one of the questions. Okay, next, I'll show you how this looks. So remember, we have uh, about 451 couples that have done this. So we, uh, this just shows um, the number, the linear prediction of the number of hours for uh, each one of these four questions after the vignette. And number one says, how much time would you go? You see here that really there's no significant dif differences between men and women. Um, <clears throat> we have some suggestive evidence that uh, negotiation, so the on the x-axis, the one all the way to the right, sort of pushes up uh, women's self-reported hours compared to private. Um, and in the second one, uh, we see also that it's possible that, again, care arrangements um, or when the spouse is home, the negotiation, again, pushes up the number of hours that women say they would go. On the right, we have some qualitative, you know, evidence or some quotes that say that, you know, <clears throat> if I'm not home, my husband can only take care of my children for two hours. And still other people would say, oh, the poor kids. Um <clears throat> I think training is important, but I can't attend fully because of my care responsibilities. And then another woman says, I'm not that smart to attend the training. My husband has more time, so he has better comprehension than me. So let's look at the next slide. This is for question three and four. How much time should your neighbor go? Interestingly, we see, and not surprisingly, that the assignment, the, the experimental assignment has effectively no effect on this. And that makes sense because if uh, the experimental grouping affects the, I say, cost of negotiation between husband and wife, there's no skin in the game. There's no friction when they're talking about how much their neighbor should attend. And so we see no um, effect there. If we think about uh, the last one is how much should your spouse go? And we see that women overall have uh, have a higher assessment of how much their husbands should go, and women and men have a, a lower assessment. Um, we see that negotiation bends this to be a little bit closer, um, and that you know that th that this negotiation piece keeps coming up as uh, having some evidence of an effect. Um, the qualitative is my husband will allow me to fully attend the training if I explain to him the objective of the training and assure him it will not have any impact, have any, any negative impact. So this is another sort of um, piece of a puzzle that suggests that, you know, communication between these spouses um, has some effect on uh, women's um, sort of ability uh, to, to attend this kind of uh, professional training. Okay, last, next one. So this slide shows the gap. So remember I uh, noted that we were gonna talk about a person's self-reported number of hours minus or difference between the self-reported and the spouse's reported hours. So this is the gap in sort of the expectation of um, the spouse's expectation and their own preference. So interestingly in urban areas, okay, so read these as zero in the um, y-axis is perfect agreement between the spouses of how much like a wife should go and the husband said she should go or a husband will go says he goes and the wife says um, he, he should go. So we see in urban areas that the negotiation piece 
brings particularly for men, the spouses closer to agreement. Um, in rural areas, we see that uh, for women, that negotiation brings them closer to agreement, so closer to zero, but that negotiation brings the male and the wife's assessment of how much he should go uh, farther away. Um, we don't have uh, tons of explanation for that split specifically. I'd be interested to hear if anyone has any ideas about that. Um, but we do see uh, some, you know, this, this differing their cost of negotiation does have an effect on their gap. Okay, I think I'm going to hand it back to Usha to um, wrap up with some uh, takeaways. Thank you, Amy. So to wrap up, um, we have tried to address the research questions previously mentioned at the start of the presentation. Um, first, we found that men and women allocate their time differently with women, especially those with children experiencing greater time constraints. And we also found that increasing unpaid care duties uh, has a stronger negative impact on women's labor force participation compared to men, and that all forms of unpaid work is more strongly correlated amongst uh, uh, for, for women living in rural areas. And we also uh, found that agency matters, uh, especially for women's paid work participation, but no, not so much for men. And in urban area, it's women's ability to manage how much uh, how much time they spend on unpaid work or seek help for doing so. And in rural area, it's uh, women's ability to manage uh, their paid work. And as Amy have mentioned before, we conducted a lab in the field experiment and the point that keeps on uh, coming up uh, from the findings is, is that communication boosts women's self-reported hours for income generating training and that it would narrow the difference between individuals preferred time allocation for the income generating trainings uh, and their spouses expectations especially uh, for urban men and uh, uh, women who lives in the rural areas so these findings uh try to help explain what uh, the trajectories of uh, labor force participation in Indonesia, uh, the story that I've told you in the at the start of the presentation, and why do uh, women's participation would tend to drop uh, around marriage or childbirth. So policies or programs uh, focused on addressing gaps in women's economic participation would need to take into account um, the time use, the care constraints uh, to avoid exacerbating existing inequalities and also open up opportunities uh, for skilled and decent work. Uh, from our findings, uh, we propose three policy packages. Uh, and the first one is to begin with awareness campaigns and educational reforms to kind of instill shared responsibility values by first in maybe engaging in men and the private sector as allies for change. And we, we also note that these campaigns would uh, require both private sector or the workplace and public involvement. Uh, the second one is to support working families by investing in care ecosystem through enhancements of social insurance and subsidized care accessibility, introduction of legal measures like par uh, shared parental leave, and making quality care services affordable for families. And finally, we also propose to equip women with skills and the opportunities by offering flexible skills development, life skills, and better job uh, access. I'm a bit conscious of the time. So with that, I would like to conclude our presentation. Thank you again for the opportunity, and I hope you found it insightful. Uh, we would like to welcome your questions, suggestions, or feedback. And perhaps I'll hand it over back to you, Ara. Thank you so much. Thank you, Usha. Um, and thank you, Bimbika, Ruri, Amy, uh, for this wonderful presentation. Um, and now I'd like to invite Ruth uh, to share her comments about the work that team has just uh, presented. Ruth, over to you. Thanks very much. It's really been exciting to see this, this work uh, take off and grow. Um, uh, I'm giving some comments both my own and then Greg Seymour, who also uh, went over the presentation, and he's sort of our our um, our guru on on the time allocation studies. Uh, so, but he couldn't attend uh, right now because of conflict. So, um, 
both of us had just reviewed the ILO time use module as part of the ILO's expert review process, which is really very interesting in the way uh, a whole range of unpaid care is getting recognized. And so um, Greg says, I can say the module has been well-designed in particular, and this is on yours, I like the recovery method for measuring supervisory care. This type of care work often goes unnoticed, even in time use surveys, unless it's directly asked about. So the inclusion and analysis of supervisory care in this study is really nice to see. Um, both of us were surprised to see the share of women performing active and supervisory care was so low. Um, and you know, as, as you authors have said, this could be that the supervisory care uh, the, the sample, older women with older children. So you could do this, you could verify this by looking at the distribution of active and supervisory care among women with younger children. Um, and I think you did have a really interesting point about the shared care. And if that's what's going on, you'll, you'll have a lower proportion overall proportion, especially if you didn't happen to hit the people who were doing that uh, supervisory shared care. Um, I, I was wondering about the simulations on what effect unpaid work has on men's and women's labor force participation. Um, do we actually see men with eight to 10 hours of unpaid work. And so if that was just a projection based on past trends, I wonder you would have a quite a different sample if, or I think men who actually did that might be quite exceptional. Um, excuse me, hiccups. The simulation Oh, sorry. Um, it's tough to interpret the agency results without seeing their construction was one of Greg's comments um, that he wasn't quite clear what was being measured. The fact that women report higher levels of time use agency re related to unpaid work than men suggests that something may be off. Do men report lower agency for unpaid work and this was my, what I was wondering, is do men report lower agency for unpaid work simply because they do less of that type of work than women? Or is it that the men who have unpaid work are the ones with low agency over it because they're stuck with it? For example, if you had uh, a father who didn't have a wife to take care of the children or something like that. Um, and not sure how to interpret the point estimate, the statement that the point estimates suggest that unpaid work agency drags down rural women's paid work participation. Is it that those who choose to do unpaid work are less likely to do paid work? Um, one of my thoughts is that you might look at this for in India, um, there's this very low labor force participation there, in part because there's a pr prestige matter for not having to work. So how much of a normative prestige factor may there be, excuse me, in not uh, engaging in paid work and norms about being a good mother, good wife, good good woman of doing all these unpaid things. Um, so just what kinds of normative context is there? Because I don't know Indonesia that well. But otherwise, just really excited to see this work taking off because I think the, the idea of getting at agency over time as well as this really refined look at how people spend their time and the, the nuances on unpaid care work is really, uh, really timely and important. So thanks.
Thank you, Ruth. Um, so anyone on the team, Amy or Bimbika or um, anyone who would like to answer some of Ruth's comments or just react to that? Uh, uh, thank you so much, Ruth. Maybe I'll uh, invite Amy to answer the questions about active and supervisory work being so low um, and the other points um, on simultaneous uh, unpaid. Oh, uh, why do you see so much uh, less agency for women, uh, for men in unpaid work versus paid work? And maybe that one, uh, you know, Ruri can also explain. And the normative question is very interesting. And, you know, Ruri is really our expert on gender norms in this team. So both to um, Amy and Ruri, over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Ruth, for these comments. Super helpful. Um, these, in terms of the um, share of women performing active and supervisory care, you're absolutely right. And we were also quite surprised by this. It turns out our sample does skew a little bit older. And I think that explains a lot of what we see. Um, we do we do have a set of results um, that we didn't present because of brevity <laughs> um, on uh, younger uh, younger caregivers. And certainly we pick up more, you know, with people that have younger than we have a sample of people with kids on younger than 10 and younger than five. And, you know, those particularly women with kids under five, you see that care spike a lot. Um, our sample is pretty small. So I was getting a little nervous about so much cutting of the sample as you can imagine. Um, so, but we definitely have evidence that the care is definitely smoothed out because of the older sample. Yeah, the agency results uh, where we have men performing eight hours of unpaid work, you're right. I mean, those those standard errors are huge because a lot, there, there are very few men performing um, eight hours of unpaid work. A majority are less than um, one hour. And, <clears throat> you know, you're right. They're also probably atypical, the ones that are driving that result. Um, and we should definitely think about that. Uh, unpaid work um, in terms of the agency. Yeah, agency around unpaid and paid work. We were actually talking about this as a team last night. And one of our thoughts is that, you know, women, it, it seems that women have feel like they're household managers and that the unpaid agency has a lot of, um, you know, a lot to say about how women can allocate their time within the day within those activities, but probably says less about, like if you think about that unpaid as a bucket, um, it's it's harder for them to um, allocate time across those buckets to paid or other kinds of work. And so I think that's what that's picking up. Um, that being said, I think we're gonna go back to the drawing board and think about different categorizations. I've gotten some comments about on the categorization of paid and unpaid agency and the and the questions that we're using. So um, I think that that's worth another look. Um, and I'll let leave Ruri to uh, comment on the um, norms because she is the, the expert. Um, thank you, Ruth. Uh, thank you for the comments. Yes, I think with India, I think there's a, I think I can, I can say that there is a similarity in terms of norm. Um, although I'm, I may not, I'm not really sure that whether women in Indonesia taking, uh, uh, being, you know, a good mother, uh, being staying at home is, uh, acknowledged as being prestigious. But uh, from our previous work on social norms that drives women's economic participation, I think we've seen uh, consistent narratives about that, you know, women's responsibility is an ideal, you know, ideal role for women is to provide care for children. And we actually, in this project, we also did uh, some qualitative um, data collection and we found you know, particularly when we probe about their choice, you know, in hours of training from the experiment, lab in the field experiment, uh, we can see a consistent narratives about, you know, uh, that we choose this number of hours, uh, we cannot go any further because uh, our main responsibility is to provide uh, care for our children. So it feels wrong if, you know, 
if if they if women have to do you know attend fully the training etc so i think that resembles a little bit with uh india um yeah that i i can say maybe i pass it again to bimbika thank you so much yeah i mean um ruth uh, your question was very interesting and we actually um you know, when we look at the labor force survey data, and uh, my colleague Usha can sort of sp speak about the specifics, actually, you know, we saw that the most interruptions and the, uh, you know, the sort of, yeah, the most interruptions are actually among people who are less educated. And, and you know, if education is a proxy for income, that means that you don't actually see the trend that you see in India, in Indonesia. But having said that, there are two things that we see. One is that, you know, the richer women are able to afford childcare arrangements. So more than, you know, those who are poorer. So I think the lowest level of participation is actually in urban Indonesia, for instance, where, you know, and Ruri has done a lot of work on commuting and other barriers are much, much greater. But the, the issue is more on underemployment. So underemployment, women working less, um, hours, less than 35 hours is more pronounced among women who are more educated. So maybe the prestige factor comes in in underemployment as opposed to like, you know, less participation overall. So just a comment, uh, I'm reading the comments here to respond to Agnes's question about uh, there may be locational difficulties in reallocating across buckets if paid work takes place elsewhere. Yes, completely. And one of the things that was interesting was that when we were doing the experimental questions, one of the one of the things that particularly women kept asking is, do these hours, like zero to eight hours, include travel time? So travel time is a really big deal um, for for women, and so thinking about how to incorporate travel time and how that might affect you know your like to use my silly example real like allocation across buckets i think that's a really good point um and this point that kiana putti asks about supervisory care um i think maybe i'll leave that to re maybe there's some evidence in the qualitative so the question is um interest she's interested in uh, supervisory care done by men, and most studies suggest that due to societal norms and gendered expectations, women tend to take initiative in supervisory care, and whether, uh, you know, there's insights into how the distribution of care happened, particularly on the enabler for men who takes on supervisory care. Hmm. Uh, I'll throw that tough question to Rui. Yes, this is uh, quite tough. <laughs> so, um again um insights on how the distribution of care happens particularly on the enabler for men who takes on um yeah this is uh well th we we need to do a little bit more elaborative you know more analysis on this um and also because the qualitative data collection that we do were actually specifically, you know, probing the uh intra, you know, intra household bargaining actually. But yes, I think <laughs> I'm sorry, but I think this is a very tough, uh, for us interesting also, uh, to help us, you know, understand uh how care is shared between. A men and women. I think this is also related to uh, Iburu's uh, question before about, you know, to see the shared care uh, between uh, men and women. Yeah. Bimbika, would you like to add? <laughs> uh, well, I think that's the story we're saying, right, that there isn't um, much sharing of care. And that's really sort of evident. Um, I thought what was really interesting, I wonder if... Um, you guys can think of help us think about it was was that you know when when we looked at you know the proportion of time spent uh by women on different categories of work it seemed like you know supervisory care was sort of more temporal but you know 
domestic care was almost like constant across age groups. So for you know a specific period of time, you saw a spike, but then it eventually reduced, but it was actually the domestic work that was sticky. Um, but I wonder if you know we can actually say this confidently with our sample, given most of it is older <laughs> and 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 fewer um, who are actually doing this type of work. Uh, but anyways, um, that's that's food for thought. I'm in, in terms of enablers, I think you know, like, um, yeah. Sorry, over to Usha. Thank you, Vimbika. Um, well, we, we we define supervisory care as uh, doing something well, being mindful of the children or uh, perhaps other care dependents. And I think I can share a little bit uh, from our analysis uh, at the just the urban uh, data. And and this is this may not look at into how care is distributed between men and women, but I uh, we can share a little bit about what women is actually doing while they're doing supervisory care. So in our uh, in our previous analysis, we find that a larger proportion of women with uh, children they provide supervisory care while doing tasks that kind of require less attention, like resting or eating. Uh, in comparison to uh, women who are taking care of older children, um, they usually uh, do it. Uh, uh, women who take of uh, take care of older children usually do more intensive tasks like cooking and cleaning, and this kind of highlights how demanding supervisory care can uh, of young children can actually be. Um, I think that's that's the addition from me, and over to you again, Bindika. Um, or we can actually get to the question um, in the chat. I don't know if the team, you have a chance to see Tammy's question. Would anyone like to jump in? Whether un under employment has a locational effect. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, we, yeah, Ruri, like the under employment. So we talked about, I think, responding kind of to Agnes's point. Unlike India, where you have like, you know, the richer sort of middle class households actually um, where you see fewer women participating in Indonesia, you see if uh, if education kind of can be somewhat of a proxy for um, wealth. You see like more educated people um, continuing the, uh, their uh, transitioning to work and continuing on, whereas others you see like a lot of breaks and and challenges with re-entering. Um, so it's much more smoother. But the underemployment is more of an issue. And whether or not that has locational constraint, it's a good question because, uh, you know, when we are also looking at regionally what the labor force participation looks like. And of course, you do see that, you know, the educated workforce is in urban areas. In urban areas, the commuting challenges are a lot more and the distance between work and home are a lot larger. I don't think we can respond to your question using the study that we did right now, but perhaps we can through our um, sort of larger analysis. I think it's a really good question and we should definitely look at it. Thank you. I think the other thing to think about with supervisory care and uh, is like not just underemployment, but under productivity, right? So if you're working in a any kind of paid work and doing supervisory care, as most of us with children in the last three years have learned, like you just can't uh, you know, concentrate. There's always some background stuff happening. And so thinking about how just the the supervisory care needs um, hour by hour affect people's ability to perform any kind of work that takes, you know, well, any kind of other work matters, I would say. Um, Sheila, great question, yes. Uh, again, for brevity, like we had to make some editorial choices. So Sheila asks if they if we did any sub analysis using questions on voice related to time use, given the results uh, from the vignettes. And we do have a full analysis related to the categories of um, the categories of agency that are laid out nicely in your paper. And um, so we do have some results. I don't remember them off the top of my head right now. 
but um, yes, we absolutely are looking at that. And I think over the last couple of weeks, we've sort of moved to sort of putting all of these di different types of agency together and thinking about how they are in conversation with one another. Thanks. Can I add to that? You know, one really interesting thing, um, Sheila, was that, you know, when you when we kind of dissected the questions, it took us a while to think about it. But, you know, many of the questions about self-efficacy voice is more about like, you know, the definition of agency, which is, you know, can you, you know, can, do you have a goal and can you pursue it? Right. So, you know, uh, I think uh, there's a lot more clarity on like unpaid work is also a goal. Like, can you change your schedule? Can you do you have voice over changing your schedule? Those kind of questions actually scored really high for women, but then questions on paid agency scored low. That's why we thought, you know, it'd be important to sort of find some way of um, distinguishing um, those, uh, you know, those four categories across the paid and unpaid agency as well, because it, it was very hard to inter interpret the responses when we sort of had a, like an aggregate figure for self-efficacy of voice or whatever, yeah. Thank you, that's really interesting. I look forward to reading the, the full, you know, seeing all of the analyses. Great. Also um, managing those attitudinal questions and that, like you all have like a lovely way to, like thinking about how to, to really categorize people well with all of these attitudinal questions was a challenge as you all have worked through, I know. <laughs> um, I think we may just have time, enough time to answer Ye Young's last question. Um, she was wondering, would women's unpaid high agency reflect their preference with positive implications for their well-being? It would also be interesting to see how women allocate their time towards certain activities among unpaid work. Any any insights, reactions? Well, maybe we should all say something and 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 as a closing. I sure. think this issue of well-being is quite you know difficult because in some ways we you know we define well-being as ability to have you know independent sort of income, for instance. But you know, I think there are a lot of disincentives to work. Actually, you know, you have to navigate commute, you have to balance work, you have to you know. There's so many other things, and you know, norms are restrictive. So, you know, in some ways you can, the agency question maybe is more harder than perhaps like the economic empowerment where you're, where it's clear, you know, in the, in the context where choices are denied that there is a process of change. Whereas agency to disentangle, you know, responses to agency and actual well-being is, is more challenging. That's my <laughs> two cents. <laughs> Over to you colleagues. I guess one of the things that I've been thinking about is as, as we um, sort of learn more about what's happening with these data is like, you know, women and, and men are, are responding to an environment that is there now, right? And so if there are constraints in terms of care, care or social norms or whatever, we're seeing a reflection of, of the current set of parameters. And, you know, our task in moving forward is to think about what happens when one of those parameters changes. And so, you know, does the provision of care uh, change things to the, does the, you know, like a push of social norms change things? So we're seeing a very specific set of outcomes based on a, a, cur a current set of parameters. Well, yeah, just echoing to Wimbika and also Amy, I think with the uh, well-being, uh, I agree that it's difficult to measure, but the state of well-being, if we about to ask about it, uh, I think, uh, like Amy said, so it really depends on, you know, their, if I can say, you know, that's optimum for them at the moment, given the social norms, given their, uh, you know, ecosystem, their environment, etc. So, um. Yeah, and I just would like to make a side note on the instrument. Um, perhaps this is useful for those who are reviewing the ILO modules. Um, we we initially um, only use the one activities, but then later we decided to 
uh, pilot the simultaneous activities and uh, the result was if we only take one simu one activity only women tend to undermine their uh, care activities and domestic activities when we had these two activities a uh, row of activities then we could probe more that whether when they do the paid work they actually also pro uh, performing like active care or supervisory care and, uh, we got that using the simultaneous activity so i think that also you know provide you know some of illustration about how women allocate their time you know to certain towards certain activities thank you usha anything else you'd like to add I think Bibika, Amy, and Ruri has uh, com very comprehensively added their comments, so no further additions from me. Thank you, Ara. Thank you. Um, so I guess it's time to wrap up. This has been a really wonderful discussion. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and special thanks to Bimbika, Ruri, Usha, and Amy uh, for sharing your work with us. Um, so if you have any questions, would like to discuss an opportunity to present your work um, in one of our webinars, please reach out to me. and. Thank you again, um, and we hope to see you all at our next webinar. Thank you. Thank you.